together, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures whether these things are, were so. Therefore many of them believed also of the honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. And when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea, but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. Beloved, the setting before us is that Thus far in the book of Acts, we have the, as they had said there, in the verse that we just read there back in verse number six, where the Bible says of the people of God, and when they had found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying. Now this is the way that these people had described the work of the Lord's early church there. These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. We had read last week, I believe last Sunday evening, with regards to the book of Acts and how that the apostles, the early church, they were told to uh, abide there until the Spirit came upon them, until they were endued with power. And then they were instructed to go into all the world, to Jerusalem, to Judea, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, not very much time has passed as of yet, beloved. And lo and behold, now the way that the people describe that which is happening here is that they describe it and they say that they have turned the world upside down. Now, obviously, this is one of these times that we know that it is not literal. We know they did not literally take the world and turn it upside down. But I would like for you to think with me this evening for a little bit exactly what would have been entailed in their world's being turned upside down. Well, to, to put it exactly what had happened, for a great many years, the scribes and Pharisees, they were pretty well in control with regards to all of the religious environment. They had the scribes, they had the Pharisees, they had the Sadducees, they had the high priests, and they pretty well, they were in control of all of those things that were taking place. The Lord Jesus Christ, he shows up on the scene. He is born of a virgin. He begins his earthly ministry, and lo and behold, after approximately three years of engaging in that earthly ministry, they had hated Christ so bad that they ended up crucifying him before everything was finally said and done. But what they did not realize, once again, look back, I know we've read it several times, to Matthew chapter number 28. What they did not realize is that when they had crucified Christ, it was the desire of the religious people of that day, it was the desire of the satanic forces of darkness, beloved, when they had crucified Christ to finally put an end to all things with regards to Jesus Christ. But yet what they did not realize is that when Christ was crucified, beloved, that that was not the end of things, but rather that was only the beginning of the world being turned upside down. Now the Bible back there in Matthew 28, beginning there in verse number 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Now, beloved, as Christ gave these instructions, if you look back in verse number 16, how many people was it that received these instructions? It's the third word there in verse number 16. 11. There was a group of 11 people. They had previously been followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, though when he was crucified, they had forsaken him for a period of time. But there were 11 men there who had previously been followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And after Christ was raised from the dead, he had told them, I want to meet with you all in the mountain over here. We're going to set aside this place. And as he met with them, that is when he had given unto these 11 people the Great Commission, 11 people. Well, they had ended up there in the book of Acts. They waited for the Spirit to come to empower them. But from Acts chapter number 1 or Acts chapter number 2 up until the end of, or up until Acts chapter number 17, the Bible says of those 11 men that they had turned the world upside down. What would you envision Lexington to look like if the city of Lexington was turned upside down? Once again, obviously, we know not literally. 
But if the city of Lexington were ter- was to be turned upside down for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you suppose that that would look like? In other words, how big of a change would take place as opposed to what is happening here now within our city? You see, beloved, the early church members, they had a passion for the gospel and they also had a willingness to obey the gospels and their enemies then accused them of turning the world upside down. And I would ask the question then this evening, is it still possible to see our world turned upside down in our day. Is that still possible? Now, I want us to realize, beloved, there are sometimes with regards to math, mathematics, I'm not a mathematician by a long shot, but there are sometimes that we tend to underestimate what exactly can take place with just a group or a small handful of people. Now, here's what I want you folks to see this evening. If we, with regards to here in the church, if everyone who is a member of Bryan Station Baptist Church, if Jaden would go out through the course of this week and Jaden would say, you know what? I really have a passion for the gospel. I have a heart to witness. I have a burden for the Lord. And Jaden would go out and only tell one single person about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do not know whether that individual is saved or not. We do not know. That's between that individual and the Lord. Jaden's not commanded to save that individual, but he is commanded to deliver the message. Not only has Jaden gone out and done that, but Silas has gone out and done the same thing. Where Silas has gone out and he has given a clear gospel presentation of what Christ has done. Not only have these two brethren done that, but Sister Marion Thompson. The Lord puts her in a position, someone comes into their place and she's able also to to give a clear gospel presentation to have a good witness with someone else. Imagine if every individual who is a member of our church, if every last one of us would have that opportunity to present a clear presentation of the gospel to a lost person this week. Now, once again, we cannot sit here and say, well, there would be a hundred people saved. We don't know if there would be one person saved or if there would be anyone saved. There may be one person, there may be zero, there may be 25. But the point is, beloved, is that God will take and bless the obedience of his people as he's told us there in the Great Commission to go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. As a result of that, beloved, as a result of these 11 men, 11 doesn't seem like very much. There's probably 11 back there on one pew that's pretty full maybe. But 11 people does not seem like very much. But if you have 11 people who are willing to take and carry that news to individuals who are lost, beloved. Now, now don't get me wrong. We're not preaching a prosperity gospel here this evening. But what I'm telling you folks is this, that God will bless the obedience of his people. He will bless it. Now, by the same token, I come and I preach. I've been preaching on Sunday nights with regards to the church, upon the urgency of the hour, upon the importance of us being faithful witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been preaching on that. We dealt somewhat with it. I had an enjoyable time last Sunday evening in the the fellowship hall. I'm sorry, last Wednesday evening in the fellowship hall. Lord willing, we'll do that again here in the near future. But the point is, beloved, that if we're not careful, they say it takes, what, 21 days to develop a habit or something like that, 21 days, 29 days. It takes that many days to develop a habit. Beloved, one of the great things that is a heavy burden upon my heart is that I fear that we as the Lord's people, we come to the place that we are not in the habit of witnessing to the lost around us. We just get to the place that it's not our habit. Now, we may at times, we may talk talk to people, and it's good to talk to people. It's good to show kindness unto people around you. That is a good thing. That's an admirable thing to do. But if I simply run into someone at, at at the hardware store, and I talk to them about the weather, and I say, boy, it sure has been hot, and and this, that, and the other, and be sure and stay on the Gatorade, or or try to beat the heat the best you can, and it's been good to meet you. It's been good to talk to you. And we part ways. I may have made it a, a con with the individual, but that is not a gospel witness. We realize that. You see, people, all sorts of lost people come into contact with other people and they will talk about any number of things, the, the, the sports, the government, the weather, any number of things. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. 
But what I am saying is that it tends like that it seems like we get into this habit, that we develop this routine, that when we come into contact with people, there's something there about sharing the gospel with them. And we've mentioned it heavily in the last two messages. It seems like that we get a little bit fearful about it. It seems as though we come to the place that we feel as though they're going to think poorly of us, that they're going to look down their nose at us, that they'll say, say, well, I'd rather talk about the weather than the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, we as members of the Lord's church, we have not been called strictly to talk about the weather and only to talk about the weather, but we've been called witnesses, called to be witnesses of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's our high calling. Amen. Right. That is our high calling. Beloved, if I were to take and say that I desperately need a watchdog at my house, and I take and say it's of vital importance, and I mean to tell you we're going to spend some money, we're going to get ourselves a watchdog, and then I get a watchdog. And so that watchdog is now there at my house, and that watchdog, we may be able to pet the dog, and the dog's cuddly at night while we watch TV. The dog may be good at catching squirrels or catching rabbits or any number of things. But I'll tell you what, if that dog does not serve its purpose as a watchdog, then that dog is not serving its purpose, period. In other words, it's not meeting the calling for which has been placed there at my house or therefore which I've purchased it for. We as members of the Lord's church, beloved, if we're not careful, we come to the place that we, we may look at other churches and think, well, this church over here, they will witness to someone. This church over here, they will be a minister to someone. This church over here, let them go out and do it. And if we're not careful, beloved, it will come to the point that though we are not hard shells by name, we will end up being hard shells in practice. In other words, we don't want to talk to anyone about Christ. We'll talk about anything and everything else. But it seems as though we're fearful to speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's a saying, it's been some contention about who actually coined the saying. I go back to the fact that Solomon had said that there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, but the first time that I ever heard the saying was from a man named Bob Hughes in the Philippines. I'd seen it in his writings. And the saying is this, the church which does not evangelize will fossilize. The church which does not evangelize. In other words, if we come to the place that we're not telling other people about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, then it will reach the point, beloved. And I, I've seen it happen numerous times, beloved. I could give you names and addresses of churches where the church, we come in together as a church and we're all having a wonderful time. We just, I love each and every one of you that are here tonight. There's no one in the world that I would rather spend time with than you all. But the thing about it is, is that it cannot just be uh, only the fellowship within the members of the Lord's church that we take and say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm faithful to go to church three times a week, and whenever I'm in church, boy, I rub shoulders, I shake hands, I give hugs, and everything else to, to the people in our church, and man, I just love them so much. That's a good thing. That love ought to be there. It should be there. But beloved, that is only one facet of being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. That other facet must be that we have an outreach among the people. Now, once again, I would ask of you this evening, is it possible to see our world turned upside down in our day to day? Well, look with me in your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter number 1. The Bible says in Romans, chapter number 1, in verse number 16, hopefully a familiar verse to many of you, Romans, chapter number 1, and verse number 16 the Apostle Paul says there, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Let me ask you a question this evening. Based upon how many people we witness to, would it have the appearance that we're slightly ashamed of the gospel? Would it have that appearance? What I mean by that, and once again, I do not know who I speak to this evening with regards to 
what your personal witnessing life is like or what we refer to as personal evangelism. I did not know how many people that you witnessed to throughout the course of the week. Maybe some of you witnessed to 50. Maybe some of you witnessed to zero. I don't know. And I don't want to assume that nobody's ever witnessing to anyone. I believe surely we have faithful witnesses here within the church. But I know in my own personal heart, beloved, that it can come to the place that I'm just somewhat fearful. In other words, I walk up to a couple, two or three men in the hardware store in public, and if they're there cussing and they're talking like they shouldn't be talking, and lo and behold, maybe I will start to mention something to them, and it's almost like I cower in fear that I'll kind of be like, well, I, you know, I don't, if I mention Jesus' name, they might start cussing, and then what am I going to do? But the truth is, beloved, that the Apostle Paul said, therefore, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. This was true of the Apostle Paul. It was true of the 11 apostles who had received the Great Commission. They were not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that they had gone from house to house and witnessing to other people and telling them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You know, beloved, oftentimes we do not realize it, but contained in the gospel is indeed the power of God. That's where the power comes from to save a soul. That's where the power comes from to be able to quicken a soul. And once again, whether it's we as preachers or anyone else, we have to be careful that we never come to the place where we feel like, well, if I can give a better illustration of the gospel, then maybe the Lord will use it. Maybe if I give a better story, a sad story, a happy story of the gospel, then maybe it will be more effectual. Beloved, the power to save a soul is contained there in the gospel. And it contains all of the power that is needed to save a soul. Amen. Now we realize Christ himself used illustrations while he was here. But the point is, beloved, that we must never lose sight of the fact that in order for a soul to be saved, as Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. He goes on to say in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Now maybe we say, well, what does the Bible mean? Therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Well, when the righteousness of God is revealed, beloved, that has to do with the fact that it is impossible for a filthy, rotten, vile sinner to be declared clean in the sight of God because God is absolutely righteous and he can have no unrighteousness in his sight or in his presence. In order for us to enter into the presence of the Lord, we must must be cleansed through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So once again, beloved, I would ask of you, if we're to turn the world upside down, it may be through a personal verbal witness that we're able to give to someone. It may be through tracts that we're able to pass out. Now, once again, there are some people who they don't like gospel tracts. They'll take and say, well, the gospel tract's not the same as preaching to someone. There are sometimes, beloved, that we're in the position that we're able to give a gospel tract that we're not in the position to be able to take and preach a sermon to an individual. Going through the drive through it's easier oftentimes to hand them a gospel track than it is to hold up 10 cars behind you. It's easier oftentimes to leave a gospel track on a table of a busy restaurant than it is to take and, and be able to preach a sermon to them. But it is all a matter of getting the gospel out. Making sure that people hear the gospel making sure whether it's the uh, gospel verbal message or the printed page. But beloved, you see, in order for the gospel to have its powerful effect upon others, it must be proclaimed. There was a time back years ago in the life of King Josiah, and when they began to renovate the temple, the book of the law was found there in the temple. And as they began to proclaim the book of the law, great conviction fell upon King Josiah and a revival ended up taking place. Now here's the thing. The book of the law was there in the temple the entire time. But it was not being proclaimed. In other words, beloved, when it comes to the gospel, we must be a faithful people to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We had mentioned last week partially did not get all the way through it, but we would ask then this evening to follow up from last week's message, if we will not proclaim the gospel of Christ, who will be the one to do it? 
If we're not willing to do it now, then when will we be willing to do it? You see, there are times, beloved, that it's almost as if we can fancy ourselves and take, say, well, I know that I'm not a faithful witness now, but I think what's going to happen is that as I mature over time, then when I become more and more and more of a mature Christian, it will just come natural to me that I will be able to proclaim the gospel. Beloved, maturity comes from simply beginning to proclaim it. In other words, don't sit and say, well, I'm 20 years old now. When I'm 50, then finally I will be mature enough to proclaim the gospel. It doesn't work that way. The Bible tells us to pre go into all the world and teach those who are lost about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're not willing to do this now, then when is it that we will be willing to do it? Peculiar thing about it is, is we have a track rack out there. To be honest, I would be curious to know how often it is that we have to replenish the track rack and at the same time, I would be a little bit fearful to know. Like to know, but I'd be fearful to know. It's a funny thing, we have ladies here who they will print tracks by the thousand. Brother Tanner sends thousands of tracks out through the U.S. mail, great blessing. But beloved, could you imagine if all of us were able to take and give even three gospel tracts a day out to those that we come into contact with? Now, once again, I know some of you, you may not get out of the house. You may not come into contact with an individual to give a gospel tract to. But you see, the thing about it is, it is a matter of redeeming the time. I've met people who were missionaries before, and sometimes I... If, if we're not careful, even as pastors or missionaries, there are times that a missionary, I may have looked back on my missionary time on the field and take say, well, you know what? I, I'm not a very faithful witness here in America, but boy, as soon as I get to the Philippine Islands, that's when I'm really going to start being a faithful witness. Beloved, it is a matter of being a faithful witness right here, right now. Do it now. Don't feel as though if you put it off long enough, everything will get better. But we had also asked, I believe last week, is it possible to get so caught up and so busy enjoying God's provisions in our lives that we begin to neglect our evangelistic responsibilities? Look with me in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter number 7. We had gone through this with regards to the life of Elisha. And application is the way that the Lord had used it back then. But I'd like for you to see another application of the passage here. 2 Kings chapter number 7. And the Bible says there in 2 Kings chapter number 7, the city had been shut up there for quite a time. They were under siege. A wicked king had come and basically barred them from being able to enter in or out of the city. And then there in 2 Kings chapter number 7, beginning in verse number 3, the Bible says, And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here till we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. Now, beloved, do not lose sight of the picture before us. They had been shut up there in the city for several days to the point that people were starving to death there in the city. That's how long they had been shut up. That which had them shut up was fear of the Syrian soldiers, the Syrian army, which they were under the impression was right outside the city. And for a period of time, indeed, they were outside the city. But these four leprous men, you see, they get up and they go out. And as the Bible says, and they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. 
Now, once again, the picture goes on to declare unto us that the four leprous men were there in the city. They were fearful of the Syrians. All of the children of Israel, they were starving to death there in the city because they were under the impression that the Syrians were out there. Yet right outside the city, beloved, the Lord had delivered unto them when we preached it. We said the Lord provided a grocery store, a free grocery store, right outside the walls of the city. And the Syrians, when they left, they left in such a haste. If you notice that phrase there, the Bible says, and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thin silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried it thence also and went and hid it. In other words, beloved, these four lepers, they were living high on the hog. They had come to the place in their life that they had so much gold they couldn't carry it all. They were able to go in and get an arm armload of gold, carry it out and hide it, and come back and get another armload of gold. But while they were living there in the midst of a lap of luxury for a period of time, if we may call it that, while they were living with all of those riches, one of them said there, now notice what they said, then they said one to another, we do not will. We do not will. Let me ask you folks a question. What does it mean if you, if you talk about someone and you describe that individual as being will to do? What does that typically mean? Help me out, man. They have all their needs. They have, they, have, no they have no worries. In other words, that typically what comes to my mind is say, boy, that, that man or that woman or that family, they're a will-to-do family. Their needs are met. They have money in the bank. Everything's well. They're doing well in life. Well, these lepers, you see, beloved, the Bible says, then they said one to another, we do not will. Well, what are you talking about? You're not doing well. We do not will. You have so much gold that you're able to scoop it up and carry it over here and find a place to hide it. And then you have enough time and enough gold to go by and get another armload of gold and hide it over there too. Not only that, but you have all kinds of food that's laid out before you. You've been starving to death for the last 30, 45, 50, 60 days. You've been starving to death. What do you mean you're not doing well? You have gold, you have money, you have food. What do you mean you're not doing well? What does the Bible go on to say? Then they said one to another, we do not will this day. I'm sorry, we do not will. This day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. It's a day of good tidings. They think back to their fellow residents back in the city of Jerusalem, and they think, say, you know what? The really sad part about it is we still have friends, we still have family who are dwelling back in the city of Jerusalem. And you know what they're doing? We did not read it earlier. It's a sad account, one of the saddest accounts in all the Bible. But the people who remain back in the city, beloved, they were actually taking and boiling their children and eating them. That's how hungry they were. They were so hungry that they were taking bird manure and selling it to people. These four leprous men, they're out there. They're living high on the hog. They have all this food. They have all this money. And finally, they look around and they say, we do not will. This day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. In other words, they looked around to their fellow countrymen and they said, you know what? Our fellow countrymen... They're perishing. They're still living in the midst of a famine. Still people there that are dying of hunger. And here we are, living as though we're in the lap of luxury and we have arrived and our fellow countrymen are yet lost. The Bible says of Christians that we are sorrowful yet always rejoicing. That's certainly seemingly a paradox. But the point about it is, beloved, that with regards to us as Christians, I praise the Lord when we can come into church. There's nothing like the sound of the Lord's people. I would tell you to try it, but if you did it, then it would be uh, useless to try. But sometime or another, when service dismiss and all of a sudden everybody is in here and everybody is talking and laughing and having a good time. I haven't seen you since Wednesday. Or I haven't seen you since Sunday. What's going on? How are you doing? And to hear all the Lord's people rejoicing like that, 
Oh, beloved, it's a little breath of heaven. So if you ever see me in the corner like this, I'm not trying to eavesdrop, amen? I'm listening to all of you. But that is a taste of heaven. May that always be the case here at our church. May we always be rejoicing with one another. But at the same time, and as peculiar as it sounds, may we also realize that we have friends, family members, and neighbors who are perishing. They're on their way into a devil's hill. Now maybe you say, Brother Spears, do you, do you just want us to turn into monks? You want us to come into church morning all the time and never have joy in our hearts? No, beloved. That's why the Bible says we're sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. May we never forget, beloved, that we live here in a city where there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lost people. Many of them may have never heard the true gospel of Jesus Christ. May we have an attitude of prayer about it and say, Lord, according to your will, bring me across someone that I can be a faithful witness to this day. Be in an attitude of prayer about it. Lord, allow me to encounter even just one person this day or this week that I can just be a faithful witness to. And I can promise you this, beloved, if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to take and say, Lord, bring someone into my path that I can meet this week or this day. It was for Philip, it was the Ethiopian eunuch at one point in time. And the Lord had miraculously transported Philip there to be a witness to the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Lord saved the soul of the Ethiopian eunuch by the grace of God, through the grace of God. But he used the witness of Philip in order for that Ethiopian eunuch to be convicted, to be saved, and to, humanly speaking, open the scriptures to that Ethiopian eunuch. And that individual was saved. Now these men had said there, then they said one to another, we do not will, this day is a day of good tidings. Beloved, we today, we dwell in the day of good tidings. You know what this world needs? This world needs some good news. Do they not? You listen to the, the regular news that you hear on the television set or the internet. You listen to that news, and I'll tell you what, it seems like there's not much good news to be found. It's more bad news than it is good news. Whether it's we hate this person or we hate this candidate or we hate the other candidate or this person here has been embezzling money, this person here, they have jumped off a cliff, this person here, they have, they have done this or they have done that. Beloved, there's far more bad news that is proclaimed in this world than there is good news. But we as heralds of the gospel, beloved, we have got the best news of all. Amen. Christ receiveth sinful men. Amen. He will receive you. Amen. Trust him today. Then said they one to another, we do not well this day as a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household so they came and called unto the port of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied, and the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house, house within. And the king arose in the night and said to his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry. Therefore are they going out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. And one of his servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain which are left in the city. Behold, there all is the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. Let us send and see. Now the funny thing about this, the glorious news was proclaimed. The glorious news came under the ears of the king. There's boatloads and boatloads and boatloads of food right outside the camp. You don't have to hunt for it. You don't have to kill for it. You don't have to pay for it. Those Syrians, they took off and they, they lit out of there like a jackrabbit. And lo and behold, they left everything behind. All we need to do is go out there and take a hold of it. The king had a heart of unbelief something which pretty well plagued his kingship throughout the years of his life. But he said, no, 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 it's a trick. 
Beloved, as we proclaim the gospel to the lost, sometimes they might feel as though it's a trick. They might say, yeah, you just want us to come to your church so you can get our money, so you can do this or that. Beloved, the message is still to be made clear and plain. Amen. Christ receive a sinful men. Amen. Beloved, we must not let fear of failure deter us. We must not let fear of our own inadequacies. Once again, these are things that we need to deal with in the, in the weeks ahead. But there are times that we might feel, well, what if I begin to witness to someone and they may know more about the Bible than me. They may ask questions that I don't know the answer to. If they ask questions you don't know the answer to, tell them what Christ has done for you. Just simply tell them, I was lost and I was dead and trespassing and I trusted Christ for salvation. He gave me an understanding of the gospel and he gave me life. He took my feet off of the road into hell and he set my feet on the heavenly highway. This is what Christ did for me. They can't correct that because that's your testimony. Amen. Beloved, be faithful to tell them. Amen. Do not let fear of your own inadequacies deter you. The Bible tells in the book of Isaiah 55 that his word will not return unto him void. Do not be fearful of what others will think of you or anything else, but simply proclaim the gospel of Christ. Do not fear that someone's going to get into heaven by accident. Do not fear that you might witness to the, to the wrong person. But, beloved, be faithful witnesses for the glory of God. Now, I challenge you folks in this in closing. It's a challenge which I've entered in upon myself. Maybe some of you, I would to the Lord that all of you say, Brother Spears, I'll take the challenge. I'll take it up. There's not a doubt in my mind that I will fail somewhere along the way in the future. Maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow. But as a challenge to myself, I've asked the Lord, Lord, may a lost person never cross my path again that I have the opportunity to witness to and I keep my mouth shut. Amen. Lord, may that not happen. Lord, I pray that a lost person is never in my presence and I'll, I'll talk to them about any number of things. Beloved, we all know how conversation is, especially if you're given the gab. We can talk about a blue million things to people. But it seemed like when it comes to the gospel, we, we get fearful about it and we get concerned about it. And we feel as though I, I better not say anything. But beloved, the truth is that maybe that very person is there and they're searching for something in life. Maybe you're the one that the Lord has placed there, even as the Lord placed Philip in the life of the Ethiopian eunuch. You're the one as the Lord had placed Esther in the king's palace. You're the one, beloved, that the Lord has placed there to deliver that message. Will you take that challenge with me this evening? Lord, may I never let another lost person, may I never let another lost person get out of my presence without at least having a good gospel witness to them. Amen. Now, beloved, we've been talking about the nuts and bolts of personal evangelism in the fellowship hall, but let me just say that it does not require a 45-minute sermon to have a faithful witness to someone. It doesn't have to be a 45-minute sermon. It doesn't even have to be a 10-minute sermon. But it's just a matter of telling people what Christ has done for you and telling them Christ receiveth sinful men. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And if you're a sinner, if you will look to Christ for salvation, if you're willing to trust him on his terms, that he died in order to redeem fallen men from their sins, he will save your soul. How long did that take? A minute? I don't know how it is for you folks. I'm somewhat ashamed to say I, I, maybe my fellow hunters in here would agree with this. I, I can get to talking to someone about deer hunting and I'll tell you what, 20 minutes passes by like that. Sitting there saying, boy, I wish I had a little bit more time. Once again, there's nothing wrong with telling about deer hunting. Nothing wrong. Fishing stories, maybe for a fisherman, it'd be the same way. Maybe for a golfer, it would be the same way. I, I don't know. Maybe for some of you ladies, it would be a different recipe. I don't know what it may be. But it seems like that oftentimes we can find the time to talk about other things. But we're oftentimes fearful to talk about Christ. And my great burden once again is that if we're not careful, it will become a habit to us. And we would just always let it slide. Always feel like there will be another opportunity. There will be another time. 
There was a little boy that in, I used to teach second grade in a church in Hillsboro, Ohio, many, many years ago. And there would be times that I was working six days a week. There would be times that I'd be like, oh, man, I got to throw together a Sunday school lesson for these second graders. These kids, man, they're so mischievous. I don't know what in the world their families do to them before they send them in. But, boy, they just climb the walls. And I got to figure out some way to curtail these brats for 30 or 40 minutes on Sunday morning in Sunday school. Many years later, we were in the Philippine Islands, and I heard one of those young men that was in my second grade Sunday school class, he was 17 years old, and he died in a head-on automobile accident. I did not know what it was, but the Lord broke my heart over that because I began to search within myself, was I faithful to that little kid's soul? Now, maybe we said, Brother Spears, he was only in the second grade. I mean, how much, how much can you really do? tell you how much we can do. We can just be faithful with the gospel. Amen. Beloved, I fear that all of us have people like that in our lives that we've had the opportunity to witness to them and sometimes those opportunities slip through our fingers. There's one of two things we can do. We can either continue on the same path and say, well, that's just the way it is. You can't preach the gospel to everybody. I mean, it, it's just the way it is. It just really can't be done with everybody. And we can continue doing what we're doing. Or we can take and beat ourselves up and say, I've just been such a miserable failure in the past. There's no hope in even trying. Or we can come to the place in our lives that we will take and say, by God's grace, I want to be a faithful witness. Christ has said, you're my witnesses. This is why Christ has left us here. Beloved, I encourage you, take up the challenge. Take up the call that you're willing to be a faithful witness and make use of every opportunity which the Lord gives you. I'm not telling you to make opportunities. We don't have that power. But take up the challenge and take and say, Lord, every opportunity that you give me by your grace and by your power, I will make use of it for your glory. It's not about us, beloved. It's all about him. For those of you who are lost here this evening, we can do no better than to point you to the Lord and Savior that we have spent this evening talking about if you're here tonight and you're lost, I will promise you this. You may have a mediocre life upon this earth. You may accomplish things in this life. You may gain things in li this life that the world places a great value on. But if you die in your lost condition, you will leave all of that behind and you will spend eternity in the devil's hell. But, beloved, as the Spirit speaks to your heart, if you will cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He's not there to push you away. Call upon the Lord while he may be found. Seek him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here tonight and you say, Well, Brother Spears, I, I don't know if, if I don't really know if that's the case or not. I, I don't know. Is it the Spirit of God calling me, or is it just my own conscience? I don't know which is which. You may spend your lifetime trying to figure that out. But I'll tell you this, Satan is not in the business of convicting men of sin and pointing them to Christ. Right. If your conscience is pricked this evening, beloved, then look to Christ while he may be found.